Hey, hey, lecture nine four. So yeah, we're gonna get into problem solving, and, and, and I'm gonna be honest with you, I find this a, a bit of an odd chapter that they've kind of combined language and problem solving um, into two bits. And so when we try to figure out, well, why is that? I, I will be able to draw some connections, uh, but I think the connections are more than just language. We're gonna see some clear memory connections here um, and other things as we go. So so we're really entering in this this what what could almost be a new chapter, which is really the question of okay, you've you've learned a lot about now, um, you know, the perceptual systems, the brain in general, um, but especially the memory systems. And let's think about working memory. Let's get our minds back into working memory. And now we've you know attached working memory to consciousness. We're also going to kind of attach it to problem solving. Um, and so, you know, I've said to you before that this is the mechanism we use when we have to solve some new problem that we haven't solved before and we don't know um, the solution. So we often, you know, use thought processes to, to kind of come up with an answer. I talked to you about the, you know, how high could you reach sitting on the back of a camel thing. And, you know, that one was a very rational kind of building up of information that allowed us to answer that question. What you're going to learn about today is that sometimes problem solving is that sort of rational, logical kind of approach. But in fact, humans aren't real good at that. And that quite often we rely on what we're going to call mental shortcuts or heuristics to give us a quick, rough, approximate answer to something. Although quite often these heuristics can go wrong. Um, and so we're going to talk about some of that as we go through as well. So I like to kind of set this for fun uh, in the context of one of these first studies um, that was that was um, done on this. And so this is a, a bit of a shocking title, probably. Um, making decisions is a pain in the ass. The reason I, 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 I'm being so crass, dare I say, is that it's accurate. Um, some of the original interest in this question of how do people solve problems and make decisions decisions came about because of work um, where they were trying to encourage um, men to have, um, here we go, let's go through this, to, uh, to, to, to have a procedure that I'm blocking from my mind because it's so, uh, let's call it a rectal exam, but that's not the right word. Um, but basically where they, where they stick a camera up your butt and um, try to look for little potential cancer or polyps or whatever. Why am I, why am I? It's going to come back to me. Wow. <laughs> what is that process called? So by the way, since we're here, what I'm de uh, demonstrating so well to you right now is something we call the tip of the tongue phenomenon. And, you know, if we forget about this for, for a moment and just go back to memory, what's going on right now? I have that information in my head. I know what that procedure is called. I encoded it. I've talked about it many times. I've, so in fact, I've been able to retrieve it. But right now I am having a retrieval error. Uh, I had encoded the information, I know it's stored, I know it's there, I can't pull it out, okay? And we often call that tip of the tongue phenomenon because it's on the tip of our tongue, it always is. It feels like it's right there. It is a, <laughs> it's funny, I have words like hysterectomy and vasectomy in my head and that none of those are right. Um, they're being blocked by other things. So, wow, am I ever demonstrating that good, huh? So, so that, you know, really does show you the complexity of memory that you need all those three pieces in order to successfully retrieve something. So, at any rate, let's go back into the context of one of the things when you have a tip of the tongue is just go away from it. And then when you come back, sometimes it's just right there. So let's see if that happens with me. I'll just leave it. Stop trying to retrieve it. Stop it. Stop it, brain. Stop it. And let's just talk about this. So here are two patients. And what's going on here is they have a little um, dial or something that they can use while they're undergoing this procedure. And uh, often when people have this procedure, um, they they are awake and alert um, and, and it does feel a little painful. And so the idea is the patient can turn this to communicate how painful they feel at any given moment. OK, and here's two pain profiles for two different patients. Um, and, and so what we see is the procedure only lasted six minutes for the first patient, but it lasted 19 minutes for the second. So the duration was very different. Um, and um, you know, here's the profiles that you kind of see for each patient, how much pain they were in. And you see, you know, that we're on a zero to 10 kind of scale here. Um, and so this, this person got up to about a seven. Um, this person got up to maybe an eight uh, at some point. Um, and so if you ask these two patients, you think, you know, after they've gone through this, this procedure, see if I can remember. 
my gosh. My gosh. Who do you think would say it was more painful? Now, now why, is, why do we care? <laughs> why am I talking to you about this stuff? Well, we care because these colonoscopies, woohoo, colonoscopy, look at that, it just comes out, it's amazing. These colonoscopies are have been shown as, as very powerful ways to catch cancer very early on and extend someone's life from uh, colon cancer, which could otherwise, you know, kill them young. And so a lot of doctors will tell older men, especially, this is the single best thing you can do is to, is to regularly get a colonoscopy. Um, single best thing you, you can do to prolong your life uh, if you want to do it. But a lot of men don't want to do it. A lot of humans don't want to do it. Um, so it's not just men, of course, it's, it's women as well. Um, colon cancer is just more common in men. Um, and so doctors are trying to understand you know, why they don't want to do it. And, and a, to a large extent, it was because people said it's, it's sort of embarrassing to begin with and it's painful. And so they really wanted to understand this pain kind of notion. And so, you know, I've laid things out for you. We got these dials. If you ask these two patients, you know, how, how bad was this process? Who do you think is going to um, tell you it was worse? It turns out that um, patient A, may be the one who complains the most, um, who, who, who says this is, a, this is a terrible procedure, don't ever do it, I didn't like it for a moment. Even though if you look at the total pain profile, you know, patient A probably didn't reach as much pain, and certainly over the whole duration, they didn't experience that much pain at all compared to patient B. Why would patient B not be reporting the same amount of pain? Well, this is some of the you know earliest things about things like this. So people's memories, and we're gonna see how memory comes to mind. So how, how do they remember the procedure? And it turns out that they remember the experience by the way it felt at certain times, okay? The start, not that much. So how the pain began in this case is not all that important to their memory of it. Um, and, you, and you see in both of these cases, it began similarly, although it, it began more quickly for patient A than patient B. Um, the peak times, the highs, lows, intense, and extremely memorable times. Uh, so you remember what it felt like here, and you remember what it felt like here. Um, and you know, similarly, this person would have some peaks. Uh, and then the end, the lasting feeling. And the real difference between these two is this patient ended at a pretty painful moment whereas this one did not, okay? The pain was, was a while ago. And so the claim is this is having a huge impact. And this is why patient A is remembering this procedure as so horrible. Now this is actionable knowledge, right? So what you can tell doctors is, you know, whatever you do, make sure that near the end of the procedure, um, there's, there's not much pain. Uh, and, and so however you might be able to do that, whatever it is that causes pain, you know, do what you have to do to do what you have to do, but then do stuff at the end of the procedure that you know does not cause pain. And and if that's how it ends after a, a non, it's almost like waking up from a dream, right? If that's how it ends um, in a non-painful way, then then people will say that it wasn't as painful. So we talked about this as decisions, but they will actually be more likely to come back for another colonoscopy. So their decision to do this or not is being affected by their memory and something that changes their memory, and especially that that last, you know, the, the end of the procedure will have a big effect on their decision making. It shouldn't be anything about that, right? It should be about the probability of extending your life or whatnot, but this is the, the beginning of the taste of, of the fact that humans do not make decisions in rational ways most of the time, okay? And that's gonna be a theme, so. With that out there, we're going to talk about decision making, and the textbook talks about it a little bit. I'm going to parallel in some in some respects. We'll hit the same points, but I, I'm going to hit them in a different way, and then I'm going to pandemicize some uh, as we go through as well. Um, and so just to kind of walk you through a lot of the same stuff. So I like to just for fun. I, I don't know if these characters even mean a whole lot to you guys, but the original Star Trek featured two characters and we see this in, in a lot of other situations too one character um was very logic based so he was a vulcan you know in other ones sometimes these are like data who was a robot and spock kind of was like a robot right so he was a vulcan and he made every decision in a very rational logic based way 
right? And, and he's sort of what we aspire to when we think of ourselves as rational beings. Um, and then there was the captain, Captain Kirk. Um, he was a much more emotional kind of guy. Uh, his world was ruled much more by the emotions and um, he will represent the non-rational or heuristic approaches to problem solving. So I, I lay this out because it is almost, you know, your frontal lobes over here and your limbic system over here, um, rationality and emotion at the core of, of who we are uh, and often emotion wins, right? That's our more primitive self. That's our more evolved. That's the thing that's been with us for the longest period of time. So we're going to see that play out. So what we're going to do for this lecture is we're going to focus on this non-rational or, or, you know, I'll say emotion, but there's not always a strong emotion associated with it, but you'll get a sense of what I mean as we go through. So we're going to focus on that in this lecture. And in the next lecture, we'll go and talk about the logical uh, side and, and basically say, we're not very good at that. We're pretty good at this. But, but this can lead to a bunch of errors. Um, we're not so good at the logic-based stuff, but we try. <laughs> so we'll get through that. Um, by the way, uh, I give this a variant of this talk to judges on a regular basis. And of course, judges, we want to be this, right? We want them to make every decision in a very rational, logical way. Um, and, and what I tell them is that's pretty unnatural. You guys are all Kirks trying to be Spocks. I mean, we all are. But, but judges especially, that's their job, is to be a Spock. And it's not an easy job to, to, to do. And I explain to them why and some of the reasons why it can be so difficult uh, to do rational decision making. So same sort of story. Let's jump in. Non-rational, heuristic approaches to solving problems. So first of all, a lot of this stuff comes from the work of Daniel Kahneman. He's got a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Fast will be the heuristic. Slow will be the logic. Um, way. So thinking Kirk and Spock, <laughs> think of it that way, if you want. One of the jokes I sometimes tell about this is, you know, there's only been two Nobel Prizes in, in psychology so far. Uh, Hubel and Weasel won a Nobel Prize in the 60s for figuring out that in the occipital lobe, in the primary visual cortex, there were neurons that fired just to certain orientations of lines. And these were seen as the basic building blocks of perception. And so that discovery was considered very important and they won a Nobel Prize. And then Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize, essentially <laughs> for saying human beings are not always rational. Uh, congratulations, Nobel Prize. It seems like a ridiculous thing to win a prize for. Um, you know, we all see it every day all the time. But of course, he didn't just say human beings are not rational. He talked about some of the ways that they're irrational and some of the forces that are pushing this irrational decision making. Irrational doesn't always mean wrong, but it can mean wrong. Um, and and it, it, what it means is it's not based on, you know, rad, rational, logical thought. It's based on something else. And so Daniel Kahneman would talk about what some of these something else's were. Uh, and we're going to go through a couple of them now to give you a flavor. Um, and then I'll end by showing you how many of these things there really are. Uh, and maybe emphasizing one of those, especially at the end too. Okay. So let's start going through um, this notion of heuristics. One of the places where there's been a lot of research on this um, is with respect to asking people to estimate how common something is. So the sort of frequency of occurrence or how probable it is, which is really sort of the same, you know, the same sort of idea. But this is one of the, one of the areas where there's done a lot of uh, research done. So I'm going to give you a taste of, of each of those as we go through. All right. So... Let's start with probably, I mean, this, what do you, whether you think this is probability or frequency, I, I thought we would go from colonoscopy, colonoscopies to death. What an uplifting lecture. <laughs> what a lockdown lecture. Uh, let's talk about death. I mean, I put a smiley face, so it's not so, so, it's not so scary, right? Um, th this is tricky when you ask the questions the way I'm going to ask you now. So what I would, I'm going to talk to you about six different ways of dying. Let me just back up for a second. I'm going to talk to you about six different ways of dying. And the proper way to collect the data is just to talk to somebody and say, here's all these different ways of dying. Tell me how probable you think they are. And when people just see a list of things that way and estimate, then you'll get data the way I'm going to talk to you about it. But when you show them two at a time, the way I'm going to show you, people are like, hey, wait a minute, something's going on. And, and they tend to um, not fall into the trap that they otherwise do. So I'll explain what I mean. So let's just start with this one. 
What's more likely to kill you? Again, imagine this was on a long list of items. Do you think people would say, which which of these do you think people would give a higher probability of killing them? Their dog or their furniture? Again, when I ask it this way, people go, wait a minute, dog's too obvious. It's probably furniture. And then they start to think, yeah, it could be furniture. And you, that's right, it's furniture. Uh, again, with the pair, you start to kind of think that way. But when you have a list, people put furniture really low. Furniture doesn't kill you. Well, it turns out it does. I mean, the, the, the cause of death is usually somebody standing on their furniture to do something high and, and falling and going and cracking their head on the floor or something like that. So there's a lot of death that involves furniture, where furniture was sort of the cause of death, um, and, and very few that involve dogs, it turns out. So furniture is more dangerous than dogs. Why? So the real question I want you to think about as I go through these is, you know, most people though would think dogs are more. Why? And let's keep that why going as we go through. Let's talk about more death. What about these two? A hot tap water or a plane crash. Again, once you get these pairs, you, you very quickly go, hey, wait a minute. I know what I what I want to say right off, but it's probably the other one. Um, but again, in a list of items, people will tend to rate the probability of dying in a plane crash is very high. The probability of dying of hot tap water, they tend to rate much lower. It turns out that scalding tap water is very dangerous uh, and that in fact many more people die from um, being scalded by tap water, which can put your body into shock um, and, and cause death, than die in plane crashes. Why might we think plane crashes are more common? And one more just to go through this. Alcohol poisoning or lightning? What's more likely to... Wow, now the happy face is right over the martini. That's kind of weird. <laughs> I didn't move it. <laughs> um, alcohol poisoning or lightning? You got the, you got the idea of it by now. Um, you know, many people actually rate um, lightning as being a more likely way to die than alcohol poisoning. In fact, um, alcohol poisoning is much more likely to kill you than, than lightning ever will. Um, and I know some of you are saying, I don't drink alcohol. Then it's, then it's probably not likely to kill you. <laughs> You're right. Maybe for you guys, lightning is something you should be more worried about. Uh, but on a list, people tend to put lightning higher. So they tend to think of things like lightning or plane crashes or dogs as, as likely potential causes of death. Why? So this is going to be something we're going to call the availability heuristic. And, and the suggestion is when I ask you a question like this, dogs or your furniture, what you do is you kind of cast your mind, your memory back and you say, hey, do, have I heard of people dying of dog attacks? Have I heard people dying of furniture? And chances are you've heard more about dog attacks, right? Because when a dog attacks somebody, uh, you know, especially a human being, and especially if it causes death, it's a news story. Right? It gets covered on the news and we see, you know, dog in BC mauls baby or something like that. And we're all like shocked and horrified. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. When somebody stands on their couch to fix their curtains and falls down and cracks their head, it doesn't make the news. You know, for us, that's just dumb. <laughs> I don't want to hear about it when it falls off their furniture and cracking their head. Um, and so it doesn't make news. Uh, and therefore, it's harder for us to bring to mind. It's less available. Some, some instance, some example of a person dying from their furniture is harder to bring to mind. And this is what we mean by availability. If, if, if it's easy to bring to mind a story about a dog causing death and hard for furniture, then we're more likely to use the ease with which something comes to mind as a shortcut to how probable it really is. We don't have all the stats, right? We can't go to some database and see how everybody dies. And so we have to guess, we have to estimate in some way how likely these things are. And this claim is we use availability as an estimate of accuracy, of, of reality you know, of, of how, how common something really is by how easy it can come to mind. Same idea with plane crash, right? If it easily comes to mind, we can remember plane crashes and, and they always are big news events. So we know about every one of them. Then, you know, it comes to mind. Hot tap water, hmm, not so much. Um, lightning, when somebody gets hit by lightning, we tend to hear about it. Not so much with alcohol poisoning, even though it's very, very common uh, or much, you know, 
relative to lightning, way, way more common. So here, here's this general depiction to kind of grab the availability heuristic then. Um, and, and this is just a funny comic of, now this is, this is back in the other pandemic, back in an old pandemic, we're so pandemic experts now, uh, but Ebola was, it was a big deal, uh, you know, especially in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and, and it was causing a lot of, uh, death and there was a lot of worry in the USA that, uh, Ebola would come. It's kind of funny, you know, now we have a real pandemic and there's a bunch of people saying there ain't no pandemic. In that day, there was a lot of people worried about Ebola um, and then it would come and cause trouble in America. And it never really did, not not at the level of, um, uh, well, certainly not at the level of COVID, uh, you know, and, and not even SARS or anything like that, which was which was worse. But this comic just kind of depicts what could be an American reaction. And it's just making fun of it, of course. But we're imagining this, this big American who's eating his hamburgers and drinking his beer and smoking his cigarettes, being fearful of Ebola. Um, when in fact, you know, obesity um, results in a ton of deaths, tobacco results in a ton of deaths, alcohol results in a ton of deaths. All of these are probably way more deadly than Ebola. Um, but why worried about Ebola? Because it was on the news constantly. And if you hear it on the news constantly, then you start to think it's, it's likely, it's probable. Uh, and so you estimate its danger uh, far above the common things that you interact with every day that are also dangerous, but people don't talk about. They don't talk about the danger in the same way. Okay, so that'll just sort of capture it. If something comes to mind easily, we think it's more common. All right, so now let me just take this and, and contextualize it a little bit. There's, there's really two pandemics going on right now. There's two viruses spreading, I would argue. There's the COVID virus, and then there's the um, conspiracy theory virus. I don't know if any of you have family members. I mean, maybe some of you personally um, are conspiracy theory kind of endorsers. Um, I'm not. Uh, I don't understand it. In fact, I'm thinking about creating a, a series of videos specifically to kind of break down some of the things that don't make sense to me about it. But so many people do. And, and... In many cases, and I'll be honest, my family is one of them. There is an individual in my family who is a full all-out conspiracy theorist. And to me, it feels almost as bad as, as, as if that person had the virus because I don't know them anymore. Um, and they're completely caught up in all of this. And it's, it's causing a rift in our family um, that I'm trying hard not to happen. Um, but it's terrible. Why do so many people believe completely outlandish claims, you know, claims that, that, that require you to accept that all of the media and all of the doctors and nurses and all of the leaders of the world are all lying to you. Um, that's such a, that's, uh, anyway, so why do people believe it? Well, I can tell you why people believe it. I understand why. And, and social media is a big part of why. It used to be the case that for some story to get widespread attention, um, it had to, you know, be on one of the major media outlets and every major media outlet had fact checkers and they all worried about their reputation. Uh, and so they didn't want to have stories that turned out not to be true. That's very bad for their reputation as a news outlet. Uh, and so you would fact check stories and you would only present stories that, that you knew had at least some degree of reality behind what they're claiming. Social media changed all that. Social media became a platform that reaches millions, you know, multiple platforms that reach millions and millions and millions of people. And there is no vetting. Anybody can put anything on social media. And what that means is now you can come into contact with some piece of information. Um, I don't know. One, one of the ones that I find most ridiculous is people are not dying of COVID. They are dying with COVID. This is what people say. It's not COVID that's killing overwhelming hospitals and <laughs> and so they're trying to say there it's not covid at all uh, and so let's say you know you you see that and you see it over and over again in different social medias you see posts claiming that people are not dying of covid they're dying with covid um, if you see it enough then it becomes available Right, And if you're problem solving, like, is this a real issue? And you can bring to mind all of these posts saying that it's not, then that can make you believe it's not. 
Uh, and so social media, and this is how this is how foreign bodies are using it. Um, all sorts of instigators trying to create racial instabilities and all this. They're putting messages on social media that are not accurate, but that spread so widely and are seen by so many um, that are not thinking rationally about their decisions. They are just thinking, do I believe that's true? Well, can I bring to mind somebody saying that's true? And they can very easily because these because they've been flooded by these false messages and if you're just using how quickly something can come to mind as an indicator of you know how real it is that's why so many people believe so much ridiculous bullcrap now um, because social media is spreading it all you see twitter and others now trying to mark things and try to say you know we're vetting we can only vet after the fact we can't vet before the fact like we used to back in the days, but we can at least tell you after the fact that, you know, this, this is suspect. And when you see that stuff, you know, that's real, right? That, that's like somebody took the time to rationally look at that claim and found it to be lacking. Um, and so they're trying to, to, to kind of, um, you know, close the barn door after the horse is out a little bit, uh, but at least it's something. Um, you know, I firmly believe that if, if you are guilty of posting or reposting some number of these false things, you should be banned from social media. Um, we need to clean up social media and get it fact-based so that we can have rational decision-making, or at least so that the availability heuristic works right. You know, so at least if, if some fact you've seen in five different places because it's true and you start to believe it's true, then it's okay. It's when it's fake and it's still massively out there that that's the problem. So something for you to think about there in terms of conspiracy theories and availability heuristic. Here's another one that I'm involved in, and I just want to use this to give you an example of the impact this can have on, on sort of everyday life stuff. So one of the, the groups I'm working with um, now is the Toronto Police Services, which is very cool. Um, well, I think it's very cool. Uh, I, I, I'm one um, that believes that um, law and order is important, that we like certain structure in our civilization, and, and that the police job is to kind of do that for us, you know, make sure people all behave according to rules and laws that we all have agreed in society are the, are the right ones. One of the things I've, uh, when, I, when I interact with the police, I'm helping them manage their stress. And I'm realizing how stressed they are. And they were always stressed, right? I mean, think about the job of a police officer. You're continually put in these dangerous situations where your sympathetic nervous system gets fired up and you never know when that next one's coming. It could be danger to you. It could be horrific ones. Let me just give you an, a, one example. Um, I was recently talking to, um, maybe I already gave you this example. I'll give it to you anyway. I'll remind you of the example. The wellness officer from um, from one of the police divisions. Uh, you you probably heard the other day when that young boy got shot in the head um, in uh, in around uh, Finch um, Finch somewhere up there, Jane and Finch I think, and um, he was just walking. He was just a bystander and he got shot in the head. Well, one of the cops from the local division were, was the first on the scene. Um, he had to see that. And he, he performed CPR on this kid. And as I think I mentioned to you before, what he didn't realize until later in the day, looking in the mirror after dealing with, you know, what he had just seen is that he still had that kid's blood on his tunic, um, and, and which made him, brought him back to all that. So imagine a job where that's the kind of thing that happens to you on a random basis. But remember random things, right? When something happens on a random basis, you continually start to think that the next one is just around the corner right? This is your, your um, operant conditioning stuff coming in here. And so they live just waiting for that next big stressful event. Okay, so that's, that's difficult enough. You know, they really have to live with stress every day. But now you have a cop who does, so, so I throw this out there, are cops in general jerks? What would you say? When I ask you this, you think, well, I don't know, let me think of what I can remember about cops being jerks or cops not being jerks. And well, what do you remember? I can't breathe. Um, you know, you remember all the incidents um, where a cop has gone too far. Um, and, you know, think of how many cops there are in the world. Ask yourself, do you really think they're all bad? Or is it possible that there's two things going on? Some of them are jerks, complete jerks. 
And maybe some of them get carried away in the moment. You know, their sympathetic nervous system is going and, and when they should just stop doing whatever, they're just engaged and they and they take it too far. So maybe some people have trouble controlling their, their anxiety reaction. Um, but also understand there's, you know, the, this, this other sense of, well, but a lot of them probably care and they're good cops and they're trying to, to be a benefit for society, that they become cops for the right reasons. And the fact that we can remember the worst of them, the incidents that come to mind are the worst incidences. And then we start to think, okay, that's true of all cops. I can tell you right now, in the Toronto Police Force, they feel like the public hates them, distrusts them, and and is just waiting for them to do something wrong. When a police officer interacts with the public, they, they just think that this public, they got their camera ready, they're just waiting for me to screw up somehow, they're going to put it on film, they're going to throw it on the internet, and they're going to say, see, there's another one. Um, and that's how they live. And so now they have this whole other level of serving and protecting a general population that dislike them and think the worst of them. It's not easy being a cop these days. It really isn't. Um, and, and, and I'm proud to try to be helping them uh, a little bit um, while still, you know, understanding the full complexity of the situation we're in now. Um, it's, it's, there's, there's not a question of taking sides. It's a question of understanding and helping um, the way you can in, in all senses. But that's where the availability heuristic can really lead to prejudicial behaviors and all sorts of things like that. So that's how powerful this availability heuristic is. We make judgments about people based on just a few instances that we can bring to mind. going to leave availability aside. We're going to go to another one just to give you a sense that, you know, there's a number of these different heuristics. So things you bring to mind quick, you think are more common. So here's another one. And, and you'll see some of these in the, in the book. I'm not sure if the Tom one's in the book, but let's try it. So here's the notion. Just try to accept this as, as straight as you can. I'm going to give you some information and then I'm going to ask you a question about Tom. So first of all, Tom is a student at a university and this university is broken down as follows. 60% of students are in the humanities, 25% are in nursing, 15% are in computer science. So now let me tell you about Tom specifically. Tom is of high intelligence, although lacking in true creativity. He has a need for order and clarity, and for neat and tidy uh, systems in which every detail finds its appropriate place. His writing is rather dull and mechanical, occasionally enlivened by somewhat corny puns and by flashes of imagination of the sci-fi type. He has a strong drive for competence. He seems to feel little sympathy for other people and does not enjoy interacting with others. Self-centered, he nonetheless has a deep moral sense. All right, that's Tom. So if I now just ask you, what do you think? Is Tom most likely in the humanities, in nursing, or in computer science? So I could, I was going to ask you to actually indicate this and try to look at it, but I don't know how to show you the data on the fly really well um, yet. Although, you know, now that I think about it, I think I'm going to go back to that memory chapter now. And those, those questions about the false memory, about those words, I'm going to make it so you can view the answers now. So if you go back after reading this, you should be able to view the answers uh, in the memory chapter. Okay, what do you think here? The vast majority of people, when asked this question, pick number three, computer science. Why? This description sounds like a computer scientist, right? In fact, if you only show people this description, they still think he's computer science with a similar high, in, in fact, there's another bit of information I showed you that seems to be irrelevant. 15% of students are in computer science. Based on something we call base rates, you know, if you knew nothing else about Tom, and I just, if this is all I told you, and I said, what, how likely do you think he's in computer science? Or, or what do you think he's likely in? You'd say humanities, right? Because there's six out of 10, you're right, that he's in humanities. Um, but as soon as you see a description 
And as soon as that description, what we call prime certain schemas, we have these schemas are like, are like prejudices or like stereotypes, really. And so as soon as we see something that starts to sound computer scientist, lacking in creativity, you know, sci-fi over here, very detail oriented, not very social with other people. These are all parts of our computer science student schema. Apologies to all your computer science students out there. Um, and so as soon as you light those up, it's like, forget the base probabilities. It doesn't matter. He's a, he's a computer scientist. And so we call this the representativeness heuristic. If he seems to really match your image of a computer scientist in this case, then that's what matters to you. And any other information you have that should matter to you, like those original base probabilities, you throw away. And you just care about what feels right. Let me give you another example. Linda's 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and she also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Which of these would you pick? Linda's most likely a bank teller or a bank teller and a feminist? Cup of tea. What's an antioxidant? It's very good for you. Okay. People pick B. People pick two. Even though, rationally, logically, that is the worst potential choice you could ever make. <laughs> Why? Because of this word and. As soon as you put and, any, anything becomes less probable. So, okay. And, and this is the easy way to say it. Let's say that she was a feminist and a bank teller. Well, then she'd still be a bank teller, right? Because the feminist bank tell tellers are just a subset of the total bank tellers. So there's a whole lot more bank tellers than there are bank tellers who are also feminist. So this will always be the lowest prob lower probability than this. So I'll say it in a geeky way you've probably heard before. You know, if A has a certain probability and B has a certain probability, if we ask what's more likely, the probability of A... What's bigger, the probability of A or the probability of both A and B? Anytime it's, you need two things to happen, the probability of those two things happening are, is less than the probability of any of their individual things happening, of A happening or B happening. Uh, specifically, it's A times B um, is the probability of both of them happening. I just kind of messed you up, didn't I? <laughs> Let me try to say it in different ways. Um, we get so, there's things in here from single, a single outspoken woman, philosophy, um, obviously an activist, social justice, discrimination are issues important to her. Um, this feels to us like a feminist sort of approach, a feminist sort of mindset. And so again, it, it sparks the feminist schema and makes us want to pick feminist even if just the way the question is laid out should tell us this is less probable than that. The mathematics of the situation uh, in terms of probability theory demands that this is less, you know, unless every bank teller is feminist. That's the only way these could be equal. If every bank teller was feminist, then, then this could be as likely as that. But as soon as a few of them aren't, then this becomes more likely than this. Um, and so it just could never logically be true that two would be better than one. And yet our mind doesn't care about that. Our mind thinks she sounds like a feminist. And so this is the root of a lot of our prejudicial behaviors, right? They come from stereotypes that we apply to a person when they start to seem to fit some schema. Um, and then, and then we make all these assumptions about them, um, that could be completely inaccurate. So. That's called the representativeness heuristic. The other way you see it, by the way, is that when you know the worst criminals are are in court, um, usually their lawyer. I mean, this this guy still got crazy hair. <laughs> if the lawyer had his way, he probably would have asked this person to cut his hair um, and look as proper as possible. Look, look as non like a criminal as possible. 
Because if you come into court looking like a criminal, you're going to activate all those crim criminal schemas in the judges and the jurors, etc. But if you come into the courtroom looking like an upstanding, law-abiding person, um, then you're more likely going to be given the, the benefit of the doubt, right? So, um, yeah, when people see somebody or hear somebody, they can very quickly sort of categorize them as a certain kind of person, and that can color the way they make all judgments about them. That's the representativeness heuristic, okay? So again, the thing I want you to get from these heuristics is they're not rational. This isn't a logical analysis, right? In the availability, it's just what comes to mind easily. In the representative, it's like, who does this sound like? Well, you know, what, what, what does this remind me of? What, what sort of stereotypes that I have? Um, and so they're both, you know, very prone to error. Now, again, there's a ton of these. Um, and um, um, that, that, that range from literal perceptual biases. So we talked about, for example, probabilities. We've talked about availability. But, but here's anchoring. Let me just give you a sense. Anchoring is kind of a funny one. Uh, if, if I say to you, well, how old was Gandhi when he died? Was, was he older than 18 years old? Um, or if I say, how old was Gandhi when he died? Was he older than 95 years old? Um, so if I just throw those out there, but you're really going to give me an age. In the first case, you'll give me a much younger age. If I, if, I, if I anchor 18, if I throw 18 out there, was he around 18? You'd say, no, he wasn't 18. But then you might say, I don't know, I think he was maybe late 60s. Whereas with the 95, you'd be like, no, no, he wasn't older than 95. He was probably, I don't know, late 70s. But you end up at a higher period. So, you know, this is what, this, this is a key thing to negotiation. You always want to anchor things somewhere. Um, but that changes, you know, your perception of the value of something or the age of somebody simply by someone throwing out a number like that. So there are all of these biases um, in, at all these different levels of perceiving causality. We've talked about it a few times, evaluating evidence um, and, and the notion of perceptual biases are there. One of the real common ones that, that, that I don't see here, um, and it should be in evaluating evidence, um, it's kind of connected here. And so let's go back to the conspiracy theories thing. And you know, for me, when I think about these con conspiracy theories, there are, are, there are a few things that just discredit everything they're saying. And yet people who want to believe in it suffer from something we call confirmation bias, which I thought would be right in here too. And confirmation bias is, you know, once, you, once you've come to a belief system that something's true, um, you know, there's this big global conspiracy of whatever, uh, then if you come into any data that seems to fit with what you believe, you love it. You're like, oh yeah, this is really good data. Look, 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 I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. When you come to data that doesn't fit or doesn't make sense, you don't give it a lot of attention and, and, and you discredit it. You tend to, you know, downplay it, downplay its relevance. And, and so when I talked to that family member, for example, I said, you know, when you say these numbers, these pandemic numbers are not accurate, they are not true. They come from hospitals. That's where the numbers are coming from. So are you telling me that every medical health professional in every hospital around the world is part of this conspiracy and is inflating numbers and pretending that hospitals are overwhelmed and morgues are overwhelmed when really there's nothing there. It's no different than anything else. Um, this is all bull crap. Is, is that what you believe? And, and they will, because to me, that's ridiculous. You know, I know medical people, they, they don't lie and, and, and they're not that organized. <laughs> to be. So for me, that's discrediting evidence. If I have to believe that to believe you, I can't believe that and I can't believe you. That's just ridiculous. To me, it's just totally ridiculous. Um, but to them, it's not ridiculous. They can just go, yeah, 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 that's good. that could happen. Yep, not a problem. Hmm. This is a neat one for judicial context. It's difficult to judge well the potential impact of missing information. You don't know what you don't know often, and, and you don't weigh the potential value of things you don't know. There might be things you don't know that completely suggest somebody's innocence, but you don't know those things, and, and, and therefore you just assume they're irrelevant. But there could be some very powerful missing information out there. Anyway, all of these, just to give you a sense of some of these mental shortcuts we make when we come to decisions about things um, that have nothing to do with rational thought. And, and in fact, the argument is 
this is most of our decision making. Very little of our decision making is based on rational thought. Um, and you, so if we combine this back to, you know, the things we were talking about in terms of persuasion, remember that direct route and, and the peripheral route and the direct route is all about, you know, a, a, an audience that's paying attention and thinking along with you. And, and those are the ones you can try to convince with rational thought. You know, that's the TED talk situation is a, talk, a situation where people are really engaged in rational thought, but that's the exception. It's very seldom we sit down and consume information in that way and think it through with the person that's presenting it. More often than not, we're sitting in front of our TV and stuff is being thrown at us and we're making real quick um, decisions about what we're hearing. Uh, and, and those are very open to bias and they're very open to manipulation. And we've seen that like never before uh, in the last few years, in my opinion, because of social media and the inability to, to vet things before they're kind of put out there. Alrighty gonna leave it there. Um, and I will talk to you next time about logical rational thought.